UFC arrives in Singapore this weekend with two belts up for grabs. In the main event, Glover Teixeira makes the first defense of his light heavyweight strap against exciting Czech prospect Yuri Prohachka. While in the core main, flyweight champion Valentina the Bullet Shevchenko takes on Brazilian contender Taylor Santos. Plus, an unmissable strawweight rematch as Zhang Wei Li takes on Joanna Zhenjiecek. UFC 275 goes down live on BT Sport 1 on Saturday night. The prelims kick off at 1am with the main card from 3. Hello and welcome back to Fight Week. This is your official preview for UFC 275 on BT Sport. I'm Adam Catterall. Pleasure as always to be with you and pleasure to be in the company of these two gentlemen. And that is something that I'm going to have to get used to saying for the foreseeable future. The one and only Mr. Nick P and the Hall of Famer himself, Michael Bispin. The reason, lads, that I just said that is because people will be fully aware now that BT Sport and the UFC have extended their partnership for the upcoming few years to come. This is where you're going to get all your UFC content in the UK and Ireland, so make sure you keep coming back. Mike, are you delighted that you get to work with us too on a week-by-week, <laughs> day-by-day basis, even more now? Yeah? Well, it, it, it's uh, you've got to take the rough with the smooth, shall we say, but no. <laughs> all jokes aside, absolutely thrilled. I mean, I've loved it ever since I came on board as part of the BT Sport team. Of course, now we've got... Many, many more years, truly the best in the business. And of course, I get to work with you guys and the fantastic team behind the scenes. Yes, great news indeed. There you go. Nick, tell Mrs. Pete that the mortgage is sorted for the next couple of years, son. <laughs> We're rocking, lads. Red panty party, let's go. <laughs> uh, lots to come um, over the next few years uh, from us here at BT Sport covering the UFC and from everybody here at BT Sport. We hope that you're delighted with the deal. We most certainly are. And we endeavour to get you closer to the action and the athletes that you love, of which we're going to start right now, getting stuck into UFC 275, shall we? Because we've got two title fights to get stuck into. We'll start right at the top in the main event, Singapore the destination for the light heavyweight championship of the world. Glover Teixeira making that first defence against Yiri Prohachka, a guy that has impressed us so much since bursting onto the UFC scene. This, stylistically, Mike, is set for an absolute cracker. Oh, absolutely. Cannot wait for this one. Listen, Yuri Prohaska, I don't know if anybody's made such a splash as quick as he has. I mean, two fights, he's had two wins, and he's fighting for the World Championship already. And that's because the two people that he beat were some of the best people in, in, in that division and the way that he did it. I mean, last time out against former title challenger, against Dominic Reyes, that spinning elbow combination that he landed, just absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, the guy's authentic, he's unique, he's unorthodox, he's quite the character. Heavy hands, good wrestling, but still, in terms of skills and well-roundedness, it's got to go to the legend, Glover Teixeira. I mean, this man, I mean, it's unbelievable. On a six-fight win streak at his age, five of those six wins come by way of stoppage as well. Yeah, can't wait for this one. It's going to be an absolute cracker, obviously. We've backed against Glover on many occasions, Nick. No more. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not going <laughs> against this fella. He's defying all odds well into his 40s now and uh, getting that UFC gold last time out. But there's a little bit of concern. I know he's retracted this, but he has started to mention retirement and when he is going to start calling time. One foot outside the octagon. It's dangerous language to be using, taking on a killer like Yeri Pahachka. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, I think I think he's obviously got one eye on a, the big Brazil card that's kind of been penciled in towards the end of the year. I think Glover's... You know, romantically thinking what a sensational way to finish that would be going to Brazil, defending the title down there. You know, his career goes full circle. But once you start mentioning that word, once you start thinking about retirement, once you start taking your foot off the gas slightly, do you leave the door ajar, especially, as you say, for a knockout merchant like Yeri? It's dangerous talk, man. Listen, he's been on an incredible run, Glover. It's been his Indian summer, but every Indian summer has to end. And if he's not careful, yeah, he could take that belt away from him this weekend. Uh, just on Prohachka, because as you said, Mike, he's only been here a short time in the UFC. So if you only consume UFC as, as your MMA diet, you may have missed everything that he's done elsewhere. This guy's mm. been there, done it, got the T-shirt. He's very, very well seasoned. And there's a reason why he's burst on and got himself to a title shot so quickly, because this guy's the real deal. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, predominantly he gets the job done with his striking and he's very, very heavy handed. As I was saying before, he's kind of unorthodox. He has a very, he has a look of a traditional martial artist to him. He has a wide stance. He carries his chin kind of high up in the air and he does get hit, you know, and that is a good thing if you're in team Glover Teixeira, right? He does take hits, but he has a chin uh, that can absorb that kind of damage and he walks forward and he lands his own shots. For Glover Teixeira, as I was saying before, he's much more well-rounded. So I think we're going to see a complete attack out of Glover, like we did when he became the champion against Jan Blachowicz. He's going to try and take him down. And Yuri knows this. That's why he's been training at uh, Fight Ready in Arizona, doing a bit of time with Henry Cejudo, rounding out the wrestling. That's because he probably thinks Glover's going to come in, try and take him down and look for a submission. As you mentioned, outside of the UFC, Yuri has passed that test for many great wrestlers, a couple that I've trained with personally. He took them out in style, no problem whatsoever. But of course, uh, Glover Teixeira is the is different, you know, he's the UFC champion of the world. And once he gets you down, he's got very, very strong jiu-jitsu as well. And on the feet, it's not exactly guaranteed for Yuri Prohaska either. So there's many ways that Glover can win this. Multiple ways he can skin that cat. For Yuri, I think it's predominantly a stand-up approach. Yeah. Mike, I'm going to come back to you on this next question because you've obviously been there and done it and got the T-shirt. It's regarding the time of day that this fight takes place because this is obviously all happening in Singapore. It's there for the American pay-per-view market. So everybody that's consuming this is going to get this at their normal times, but the fighters are going to be fighting at very different times. How does that affect preparations and the build-up to making that walk? Yeah, well, you've got to adjust your sleep patterns. Simple as that. Now, Yuri Prohaska has been training out in Phuket for quite some time. So to travel to Singapore is only an hour for him. So he's already on that time zone. Now, that would generally be advantageous, but I'm not sure if it is in this occasion because he's fighting first thing in the morning. Uh, for Glover, all he's got to do is come out and stay on American time. You know, he lives on the East Coast, so he's got to stay on California time, uh, which he can do, you know, try and sleep all day, stay up at night, that type of thing. But either way, it's going to be a challenge. But the reality is, and I've done it myself multiple times, either super late or super early in Australia, once that cage door closes and the adrenaline kicks in and you've had an early night, whichever way round it is, it doesn't matter if it's six o'clock, midnight, it doesn't matter. You're in the middle of the UFC octagon. You've got a world-class opponent that's going to try and smash your face in. You've got 20,000 people watching. Believe it or not, you're up for the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, we've been around fighters when they have been fighting on these type of time zones and the talk about like coming up with different tactics of blanking out the room and but you can't legislate for stuff that might go on the night before or the day before. People are carrying about their normal lives, aren't they? Whereas these fighters are in a totally different headspace, as Mike says, they're going to be making that walk. And once the door shuts, I'm sure they're going to be bang up for it. But the preparation is going to be key. You've got to get it absolutely bang on when you're on a different time zone preparing for this at UFC 275. Yeah, but when we're talking about this main event, we're talking about, you know, two incredibly experienced guys. You know, year he's only had two fights in the UFC, but he's had over 30, I think he's had 31 or 32 professional MMA fights for various promotions. You know, it's not like he's lacking for experience and he's fought on multiple continents as well, mm. you know. So I, I don't think it's going to be that much of an issue, if I'm totally honest. You know, my whole thing coming into it is where does this kind of fate run out? For me, you know... Let's be honest, 42 years of age, Glover Teixeira's got no business being a UFC champion at this stage of his career. Eight years on from losing to John Jones, he finally gets the belt wrapped around his waist. I'm sure he, at times, looked at himself in the mirror and thought, it ain't going to happen for me, but it has happened. And it seems to have been written in the stars. You know, Let's think back to the Thiago Santos performance. He's losing that fight convincingly before he pulls out the back and come back of the year submission. Then he rolls into the Jan Blachowicz fight and suddenly it looks like it's all in the stars for him. Fate has decided that Glover Teixeira at some stage in his life is going to have that moment. He's going to have that belt wrapped around his waist. Are we still living that moment? Are we still living under the eyes of the MMA gods who are blessing Glover? Or is it time for Mother Nature to move on and choose a new champion? That for me is what it's all about. Has Glover's Indian summer ran out? Or is he destined to go to Brazil as a champion and defend that belt? It means way more than staying up late or getting up late. No, no, th th that's a fair point, Nick. It really is. But 
Going back to what we were saying before about the retirement type of thing, yes, Glover has publicly mentioned that, but I think he's just being realistic. I don't necessarily think that means he's got one foot out the door. It just means that he's a smart man. He's been around this for a long time. He knows he can't do it forever. He knows he's 43 and he wants to end on a high. Like when I finally got the belt, I wanted, you know, perfect game plan, defend the belt three times and then call it a day. Now that didn't get to happen because I got choked unconscious in Madison Square Garden and bingoed in Shanghai. But still, we could all have plans. You know, and that's what Glover's Teixeira's is. He wants to defend the belt three times, once more in New York City, as he was saying, because he lives in New Jersey, then down in Brazil and call it a day. That's the perfect plan. Just because he's mentioned that, I don't think that necessarily means that he's thinking about retirement already. He's a proud guy. He wants to defend against Yuri Prohaska. He knows he's got a tough fight. And I think this is going to deliver from both men. There you go. Listen, I think you've both made a great case for this being a top quality main event, light heavyweight championship on the line. Uh, and that will come after this core main event, which sees Valentina Shevchenko once again defending her crown, this time against Taylor Santos. Again, when we talk about a Shevchenko fight, Mike, it's very hard to make cases for other contenders because she is that good. But Santos has earned the right to be here. And I tell you something, this is her moment. She's got to stand up and live up to that chance and take it now that it's here. Oh, absolutely. And she's going to try and replicate the performance that she had last time out against Joanne Wood. I mean, that was, you know, first of all, her first stoppage in the UFC. But she looked fantastic. She looked really did. She was in control of that fight. We know how good Joanne Wood is, is on the feet. And Tyler beat her at her own game. Now, coming into this one, Santos, I think she's thrown a little red herring out there. She's, she's went out there and publicly said, I'm going to use my jiu-jitsu. I'm going to take Valentina down. That's how I win this fight. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going going to make you think that I'm going to shoot for a double leg and then I'm going, to, I'm going to come over the top with the right hand. That is exactly what Taylor Santos is doing right here because that's going to be the plan. She's going to go out there and try and stand toe to toe with Valentina Shevchenko and I can't wait for it. Listen, Shevchenko, we know she's the best. She's the best by far. Her and Amanda Nunes, the two female BMFs, you know, but uh, listen, everybody gets beat sometime. They do. Um, but Nick's not going to make that case because Valentina Shevchenko is by far his favourite fighter in the UFC. After you, mate. Talk to me. Mate, just break her down as an athlete, regardless of gender. Technically, she's just superb. She's ruthless. She's, you know, developed her game so much from being this elite, elite level striker to also adding a fantastic, you know, judo tips, takedowns into her game, submission into her game as well. She truly is a fully rounded mixed martial artist. And that's credit to her, her coach, her sister. They're such a tight team. They basically live pretty much on every continent during her fighting career. They're now based out of Las Vegas. You know, she's a girl that absolutely has left no stone unturned in her pursuit of becoming one of the greatest mixed martial artists we've ever seen in, in the female side of the game. And she's done that, you know, and she heads into the seventh defense against yet another opponent, Tally Taylor Santos, very worthy of being there, as Mike said, four fight win streak. But it's one thing getting point wins over Roxanne Modafferi and uh, uh, Gillian Robertson and Molly McCann and even that stoppage win over Joanna Wood. It's another thing altogether going in against, you know, a girl that's going to go down as a, in the Hall of Fame as one of the all-time greats. It's a big, big ask for Taylor Santos. And also, don't forget, Valentina Shevchenko wants to be ready in case that bantamweight division because you've got, you've got Juliana Pena going back in a game with the former champion after the tough season. She's already beat Juliana Pena. She's already submitted her. So if she's ever going to add a second belt, she's certainly going to have a look at, you know, the Nunes-Pena situation just above her as well. Shevchenko won't drop the ball at this stage in her career. She knows what's at stake. Legacy's at stake. And I'm a big fan of Santos. She comes from a great gym in Brazil, Marcelo Brigadeiro's Astro Fight Club. That was where Darren Till was based out of for a couple of years. Elite level Muay Thai, excellent Valley Tudo gym there. But it's about levels, this game. And for me, Valentina Shevchenko is up here and the rest of the women's divisions here. The point that Nick makes there, Mike, is such a valid one. It's so hard to make a case for anybody. And it doesn't matter how good they are because Santos is a sensational mixed martial artist. It's so hard to make a case for them to beat Valentina Shevchenko because she is so technically well-rounded and so technically perfect when we see a fight. Oh, it really is. 
You know, and, and to Nick's point, regardless of gender, she is one of the most technical and athletic as well. I mean, she has so much technique in every area of mixed martial arts. And then you combine it with her strength, her stamina, the speed of the woman and the snap and the explosiveness when she delivers her kicks and her punches. I mean, and then, of course, this, the mind, she has a champion's mind. And now, of course, with all that success comes a tremendous amount of confidence. And she has just the right amount of confidence. It's not confidence where she disregards her opponents. No, she comes into every fight respecting her opponents. She knows that Tyler Santos is going to bring it. She knows she's going to bring a unique challenge. And she's smart enough to know that, listen, when you continue to defend the belt. It's only a numbers game at some point. I mean, listen, did anybody think Anderson Silva was going to lose the belt? Okay, granted, he snapped his leg against Chris Wyman. But you see the point that I'm making. Eventually, mm. it all comes crashing to an end. Could this be the time for Tyler Santos? Is she going to fake out that she's going to go for a takedown, crack her with the right hand and put her to sleep? Probably not, but there's a potential for it. So that's what makes this so exciting. I love watching Valentina Shevchenko, but I also love the fact that Santos is coming into this one extremely confident, and that will happen when you're knocking out people like Joanne Wood. Absolutely. Mike, you're exempt, of course, uh, from making a prediction. Nick, back to you for the co man. It's a bit of a daft question, really, asking you anything about uh, any fight that's involving Valentina Shevchenko. <laughs> I know what you're going to do, but go for it, mate, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, a submission. I'm going to go with uh, Ta Taylor Santos having to eat her own words there about the submission game. I think that's enough That's enough motivation for Valentina. That's all she needed to hear, that she was going to make it a jiu-jitsu match. I can see this being a good striking battle, but when she wants to, Valentina, close the distance, get that sweep in, and go for that submission finish. And then she will rock the microphone, and she will be calling out the winner of the tough finale. You wait and see. Fantastic. Um, now, the people's main event, I don't care what anybody says. If you saw the first one, you know that this is going to be just as good. Yeah, you might be slightly disappointed that they've taken 10 minutes off it, but who cares, man? It's going to be even more compact. 15 minutes of absolute mayhem. Zhang Weili versus Joanna Jinjiecek. They gave us a fight of the year when they battled for the championship a couple of years back. This time, no title on the line, but big ramifications for the division, Mike. The winner mm. might just be next in line for that title shot. And there's a lot on the line for Joanna here because we've not seen her since the first bout. Listen, this is how good that first fight was. I was just in Vegas last week. I went to the gym and you know the stepper machine, you know what I mean, which I hate. Can't do very long on it. I was on that bad boy for 30 minutes watching that fight because when it started, I was completely glued to it. I mean, what a fight. Absolute back and forth action from start to finish. Both women taking a lot of shots. We know Joanna on Jacek at the end of it was barely recognizable. I mean, the head on it was it was disgusting. I mean, I've never seen a hematoma or a head swelling to that size. But the ferocity from both ladies, that display that they put on, that display of violence or art, martial arts, whatever you want to call it, it was it was mind-blowing. And I have so much respect for both ladies. And that is exactly what they know they're in store for. Yes, it could have been 25 minutes, but I don't think it doesn't matter whether it's 5, 10, 15, 50 minutes. Both ladies want to come in. They both want to win. And I think we're going to see a very similar fight to what we saw the first time Oof. out. I, I mean, I mean, how do we not? How do we not? Zhang Weili, we yes, yeah, she got clipped off Rose, but then she came back against Rose and looked fantastic. Joanna Yonjacek, she's yeah. in a position now. She is motivated. You know what I mean? She's lost a few. There was what, once upon a time, she was the woman. She was the champ. She was the one, you know... She was making tons of money. Do you know what I mean? She, she, and she still, she still got it just because she's lost a couple. But look who she lost too. Do you know what I mean? Joanna mm. on Jacek is coming into this with the chip on her shoulder, and I think that makes her very, very dangerous. Nick, she's been out of the octagon though for two years or just over two years. How big of a part is that going to be going to play? Even though Wei Li's been, she's lost a couple against Rose. She's been competitive. She's been training for the very, very best. Joanna hasn't. No, but after after that fight that they had together, that five round absolute war, the 2020 fight of the year, hands down, it probably wasn't a bad thing that she had a little breakaway because as Mike said, she came into the UFC, she picked up that belt pretty much straight away. She beat Carla Esparza, became the champion, had the runners champion, then ran into Rose. Rose ultimately proved to be her kryptonite and then she kind of stumbled into the Wiley fight and had an absolute war with her as well. I'm not against the fact that she's had a couple of years away just to mm. just to let her body recover and just to let herself recover physically and mentally. 
And I tell you what, both these girls would have been watching the Rose Nama Yunus fight, watching Rose lose her belt to Carla Esparza. And they probably wouldn't admit to it, but I bet you they were both absolutely delighted that Rose was relinquished to that belt because it means that whoever wins this fight on Saturday is in pole position to go in with Carla Esparza and challenge for that title belt. You know, I think Rose needs to go away and rebuild now. That, that whole performance, I'm still looking back on that performance from Rose Nama Yunus. I'm still not quite sure what that was even about. And Rose needs to figure that out. But what she's done is she's left the door wide open for both Zhang and for Joanna to put in a stellar performance this weekend and lay claim to it. And either of these girls, whoever wins on Saturday, will start against Carla Esparza as favourites to become world champion again. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm not hating the fact that she's been away. I think Joanna probably needed it. But what I am loving is that we've instead of having a five-round marathon, we've got a three-round sprint this weekend. <laughs> And it's going to be electric. Every minute will count in this fight with these two. It's going to be unreal. Mate, the first one was a 25-minute sprint. Yeah, yeah. The amount of strikes it that was... they landed was unbelievable. But to your point, Nick, you're absolutely right. Whoever wins this unofficially, you got to think, they are going to fight for the belt, right? Because it just makes sense. The narrative, the storylines, everything. Yeah. It's all there. So they're already motivated. They already know they're fighting one of the best in the world. They already know the first fight out probably took a piece of their soul and they left a piece of themselves in the octagon. So when you're already having a rematch of that magnitude, you are leaving no stone unturned. You are really going the extra mile. But then on top of that, you throw in, oh, by the way, you might get to fight for the championship if you are declared the winner. My word, both ladies are going to come in the best shape of their lives. Regarding Joanna taking a little time off, it, it, it's, it, it was needed. I think it was necessary and maybe she'll come back even hungrier. But it depends what she's been doing though, you know, for those two years. Mm -hmm. I know she She's, you know, kind of always working out, if you will. But, you know, she's a big star now. You want to hear Jake's a big yeah. star. She's got a big bank account. What has she been doing in those two years? You know what I mean? Is she starting to go a little soft in her star-studded older years? She's 34 years old now. She's not 25 years old, fresh out of Poland. You know what I mean? She's got a fat bank account these days. That changes things. Yeah, <laughs> can't wait for the fight, man. It's going to be an absolute cracker. Good luck to the two title fights following these two because they're <laughs> going to give us 15 minutes of pure joy. I'll tell you what, if you're mates or maybe football fans, football season's finished now and they're looking for a bit of a thrill, they're looking for something to get stuck into, bring them to this. Show them, this, show them the first fight, get them in the mood for it and then come and watch this live. I'll tell you something, they're in for a little bit of a treat. Zhang Weili taking on your NJJ check, which we were class as our People's Men event at UFC 275. Now, moving a little bit further down this main card, uh, gents, let's get into uh, Rogerio Bontorin uh, taking on Manuel Cap. Mike, I'm a big fan of Cap. When he came into the UFC, I tipped him for big things, but he lost his first two, but he's got that. He's managed to get the train back on the tracks, and it sets us up nicely for a fight that was originally scheduled for his UFC debut. This could be a belter. Yeah, that's right. Manel came in with a massive reputation, champion of some other organisations, very well-rounded skill set, and yeah, as you say, didn't really pan out. However, he's found his form. You know, I was talking to him recently, and he said, yeah, he felt a lot of pressure. You know, because he kind of knew he was being brought in to be a star. And sometimes, you know, I, we always say it, this controls everything, the pressure, the nerves, whatever you want to call it. But he certainly found his groove. Two wins, knockouts, one by flying knee, one with a beautiful, you know, display of boxing. You know, but against Bontorin, he's got to make sure that his, uh, his ground game is on point as well. And listen, the flyaways, they're always fun to watch. We know they go at a million miles an hour, but with crazy technique at the same time. It's going to be a great fight. Bonserine's in a bit of a situation as well, isn't he, Nick? Because I don't think he's had a win since 2019. If he's going to have big aspirations of kicking on in this division as we're looking up towards the Figueredos of this world, he's got to get a win against someone like Manuel. Yeah, he, he, did, he did actually win one of those four fights. He beat Kai Kira France, who's actually fighting for the interim belt now, but the fight was overturned when he popped yeah. off for a diuretic. And incidentally, he actually failed to make way for that fight as well. So, you know, that's not... It's not obviously the best. What form. are you laughing at, Adam? Uh, <laughs> I know exactly. It's yeah. not a win, then, is it? I know it. <laughs> but we, we, we were both sniggering. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But 
what we know about Bontarin prior to this one is that he's teak tough, man. You know, he's from yeah. southern Brazil. He's a farming family. I think he's still a farmer, you know, outside of fight camps and everything else. You know, he's he's as tough as they come in his ground game, as Mike's just highlighted, is world class. He is still ranked above Kappa as well in this flyweight division, but Cap's coming for him. And as you say, he's been the busier fighter, the more successful fighter. And that Manel that came into the UFC that almost got an immediate title fight, if you remember, Mm. That was made to wait. He feels like he's in his rhythm now. He feels like he's he's finally arrived. Those two knockouts will do his confidence no end of good. I think he comes into this fight absolutely with his tail up and all the pressure is on Bonterin to basically save his UFC career, let's be honest. So uh, don't blink with this one. That's all I'm going to say because Manel's going to come and he's going to let those hands go. Yeah. Kicking off this main card, which gets underway from 3 a.m. on BT Sport in the early hours of Sunday morning. Make sure you come and join us for it. Is Jack Della Maddalena uh, taking on Ramazan Meev? I remember when he was making his debut, uh, uh, Jack Della Maddalena. Mike, you were high on him. You bigged him up. You got us all excited about him. And I tell you something, what an impressive debut that was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, listen, because uh, I called his fight on the contender. And I was very, very impressed. Beautiful boxing, rips of the body fantastically. Uh, and he's lived up to all the hype. Ramazan Emiv coming from Dagestan. You know straight away, if you're coming from Dagestan, you're going to be a good wrestler. And that's what he's shown time and time again. So this is going to be a real interesting clash of styles. Can Jack keep it on the feet and go to work with the boxing? And can Emiv dictate where the fight takes place, get a hold of him and drag him down to the canvas? Stylistic. Nick, obviously, Amiv, he, he consistently goes the distance. He hasn't got any finishes yet in the UFC, but he's a grinder. It's, it's that exact style that many people, if they haven't seen him fight, when you see a fighter coming out of that Dagestan wrestling, you know exactly what the geese is going to try and do. It's a real good test, this, uh, for Madalena. Yeah, it is a big test, you know, and as you say, Amiv's coming off a loss as well. He got he lost to Danny Roberts in his last fight, so he'll be looking to bounce back and really, you know, put... Put a put a draw a line in the sand in terms of him being a contender in this division. You know he's come with a big reputation, former M1 global champion, a world sambo champion, a Pankration champion of of Dagestan as well. So that's an incredible foundation to build a mixed martial arts career on. So it is a tough fight for Madalena, but there's something about Madalena. He's just got that little bit of magic about him, mm. hasn't he? You know he's got that spark. He looks like he could go a long way. And he'll be looking to land heavy, heavy, heavy shots here. I, I'm tipping this to be a performance of the night winner for Madeleine. I can see him getting another huge knockout here and climbing up these rankings pretty quick. There you go. That's the main card. That gets going from three. Before it, you'll get some prelim action on BT Sport 1. That gets underway from 1am. Uh, every time we do one of these big numbered cards, gentlemen, I ask you for your prelim picks. Nick, I'll come to you first. You pulled rank this week. You got your name out of the hat first and foremost. Mike's a little bit annoyed with the fact that you're going with because I think he wanted it as well. But go for it, mate. What <laughs> <Off> you got? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to go with another Aussie um, to follow on from Madalena. I'm going to go with Jake Matthews, someone I've been a big fan of for a long time. It just hasn't quite happened for Jake. He tried the whole living in Canada thing. Now he's back in Australia again. The, the issue with Jake is he's kind of stuck between two weight divisions. He's too big for lightweight. He's kind of too small for welterweight. If we had that Eagle FC 165 weight oh, division in the UFC, <laughs> Jake Matthews could make an absolute run on it. But he's going to have to be on form this weekend because Fialo's absolutely no joke. Fights out of Portugal, based out of Sanford MMA. So many good men, good fighters on the mat there. He's got incredible stand-up. His dad was a boxer. He was a, a Portuguese national boxing champion before he discovered MMA. Uh, I really like this guy. He's got good hands, man. But Jake Matthews' strength is obviously his ground game. He's got great submissions. So, and nice clash of styles. I think this one catches fire. Yeah, mm. should be a good one, Mike. What have you got your eye on? Yeah, I'm going to highlight the third Australian on the card as well. Uh, Jacob Malcoon, training partner of Robert Whittaker. I saw a story of them doing jiu-jitsu about eight years ago. Jacob Malcoon coming off two good wins in the UFC so far. Uh, and he's going up against Brendan Allen. Last time we saw Jacob using a lot of wrestling. It's going to be interesting if he does that against Brendan Allen. Brendan's a very well-rounded uh, martial artist. Favours the grappling, so I'm going to be interested to see if this one stays on the feet or if they're going to go to war on the ground. But yeah, Jacob Malcoon, Brendan Allen, keep an eye on that one. Should be good. Mikey B is going to oh. be out in Singapore calling the Singers. fights, keeping us all Love excited. It. Yeah, <laughs> you okay? Do they know? Do they know you're coming? Have you warned them? Have you? Have you, have you told them you're on your way? <laughs> what are you implying? <laughs> Not implying anything, mate. Hey, Not implying hey, anything. Hey. 
My mate DJ Jackos coming. He was my old DJ partner back in the day. We used to go back to back. Jackos flying in from Australia. Woo! We're back, that, baby. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Little full moon party on the beach. Get out there. The lads are on it. Oh, my God. Brace It'll be a good yourselves. Trip. Listen, I'm jealous. Uh, for jealous. everybody else, make sure you're tuning in. Uh, throughout the course of the week, we've got loads of fantastic content coming your way. Interviews with uh, some of the biggest names connected to UFC 275. And, of course, Dan Hardy will be bringing you his big breakdown show as well. Uh, the fights themselves, prelims get going from one with that main card from 3 a.m. in the early hours of Sunday morning on BT Sport 1. Make sure you get stuck into it. Mike, enjoy the trip to Singapore. We'll see you soon for the review. Nick, I'll see you soon, mate. And for everybody else, you've got a few more years of us calling these <laughs> UFC fights on BT Sport to get used to. You're welcome. Catch you soon. Apologies. <laughs>